Egyptian pyramids are all about, immortality, guarding the king's mummy so he could resurrect in the next world. Everybody knows the pyramids of Giza, but I want to show you King Unas's improved deluxe model, and it comes with a new feature, magic. I'm taking you into the spiritual heart of King Unas's pyramid. This is the oldest significant body of texts in the world, and it's pure magic, all intended to protect the pharaoh's mummy. There are spells for everything. There's a spell that says King Unas's mummy won't be bitten by a scorpion. There's a spell that says the journey to the next world will go smoothly. Up there, there's even a spell that says King Unas devours the entrails of his enemies. Pretty powerful, huh? But what you have to remember is that this was even more important than life and death. This was for eternity. So 4,500 years ago, Unas and all his treasures were buried in his pyramid. But it didn't work. Even Unus's magical spells couldn't stop tomb robbers searching for gold. And the pyramids of Giza? They were robbed too. You see, pyramids were obvious targets. They said, rob me. So Pharaoh stopped building pyramids. It was the end of an era. Tutankhamun's golden treasures? They weren't found in a pyramid. He, along with later Pharaohs, chose to be buried in secret tombs, hidden in the remote Valley of the Kings. That's where Ramses the Great, the Pharaoh of the Exodus, was laid to rest. The only face from the Bible we may ever see. When the warrior king, Tutmosis III, was buried in the valley, it had been centuries since a Pharaoh of Egypt had been laid to rest beneath the pyramid. Their time had passed, Egypt would never build another pyramid. And then, in remote Africa, the flame was lit again. Hundreds of miles south, up the Nile, past the raging cataracts, past terrifying colossal statues of Ramses the Great, to the land the Egyptians called Ta Seti, the land of the bow. A land of legendary archers, of gold, the land of Nubia. It was a special time when amazing things could happen. For centuries, Egypt dominated Nubia, but this was about to change. This was a time when a black king of Nubia would lead his army north, past the cataracts, past the scornful faces of Pharaoh Ramses. This must have given our Nubian king a special pleasure. Ramses had always depicted Nubians as bound captives. Now it would be their turn. It was a time when black kings with exotic names, Shabaka, Shabitko, and Taharka, conquered mighty Egypt and ruled the Nile. These were no ordinary foreign conquerors. They knew of Egypt's greatness, its fabulous temples and tombs, its hundreds of gods, and they vowed to restore declining Egypt to her past glory. The Nubian kings rebuilt decaying temples and made offerings to Egyptian gods. The hero of our story is the great pharaoh Taharqa. Taharqa's campaign north into Egypt was the first time he had seen the pyramids. And when he returned home to Nubia, he vowed to build one of his own. After a thousand years, the flame of pyramid building was rekindled.
I want to show you where it all happened. But we have to go deep into Africa, to Africa's largest country, the Sudan. A million square miles, much of it unexplored desert. It's a harsh country. The locals say, when God made the Sudan, he laughed. Out here, there are more scorpions than people. Lots more. When you finally leave the desert, you ferry across the Nile. No bridges here. The locals don't see many foreigners, and they're friendly and curious. Yes, Yes. Yes, yes. On the way to Taharka's pyramid, you can drive for days never seeing another vehicle. But then, in the middle of nowhere, a place that time forgot. A desert well, a well so deep that you can see the bottom only at noon, when the sun is directly overhead. I ask one of the herdsmen how many meters deep the well is, and he says 48. About 150 feet. But this can't be right. The rope the camel pulls out of the well is twice that. Finally, we work it out. They don't measure in meters or feet. He means men. The well is 48 men deep. These people are the Bisharin, a tribe that for hundreds of years has lived in this desert. Life has hardly changed for them over the centuries. This is a place that time really has forgotten. From the well, it's still a long ride to Taharka's pyramid. And then it appears, surrounded by those of his descendants. Today, the great king's pyramid is in ruins, but this is the spot where it all started again. This is where the first pyramid in nearly a thousand years was built, and pyramid building would continue for centuries here in Nubia but the Nubians would do it their way. You can see the Nubian pyramids are much steeper than the Egyptian ones. But that's not the only difference. I want to show you how they were built. Let me introduce you to the Shadouf, the crane of ancient Egypt and Nubia. It's basically a weight on the end of a stick. They're still in use in Egypt today to raise water from the Nile. The Nubian kings used shadoufs to raise the blocks of their pyramids. Dr. Fritz Hinkel is the dean of Nubian pyramids. For 40 years, he's been studying and reconstructing the pyramids of the kings of Nubia. Using a shadouf, just like in ancient times, Hinkel rebuilds pyramids. Hinkel has figured out that when you use a shadouf to raise your blocks, you get steep angles. 
you can't place a block very far from where your shaduf is. The construction device explains why these pyramids are so steep. The Nubian kings revived pyramid building, but they did it their way. Now, let me give you a Bible quiz. Who is the only pyramid builder named in the Bible? Here's your clue. He's a Nubian. Taharqa. Taharqa the pharaoh who revived pyramid building is mentioned in the Bible as a warrior. But he's not the only one in his family with a biblical connection. Let me show you something neat about Taharqa's nephew, Shabaka. It's in the British Museum. Almost everybody walks by it on the way to the more famous Egyptian treasures. But the Shabaka stone is one of the most amazing things in the museum. Can you figure out why there's a square hole in the middle? It was made into a grindstone when a farmer found it 200 years ago. But it wasn't always a grindstone. Look over here. You can see the hieroglyphs. They're worn from the grinding, but they still tell a story, a story from the Bible. Over here, this is just the introduction. It says that Shabaka, our Nubian king, found an ancient text and had it carved on this slab. But the real story starts here, with the god Ptah. It says that in the beginning, Ptah said words, and the world came into existence. Now, if you remember your Bible, that'll sound familiar. In the first verse of John, it says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God. So centuries before the Christian Bible, a pious Nubian king was writing the same belief on this stone. The Nubian rulers were thinkers, interested in Egyptian religion and traditions. But when the time came to be buried, they returned to their beloved homeland, Nubia, and to a sacred mountain unlike any other. In the ancient language, it was called Juwab, the pure mountain. And even today, the modern Arabic, Gebel Barko, means the same. History has forgotten Gebel Barko. But for both the ancient Nubians and Egyptians, this was their Mecca and Jerusalem. It was one of the ancient world's most sacred places. The temples are ruined now, but 2,000 years ago, this was as grand as any of Egypt's great temples. Gebel Barkel was home of the god Amun, the hidden one. This is where the Nubian pharaohs would build their pyramids. Time has not been kind to Gebel Barkel, but it still has some of its magic. I wonder if these birds are just playing with a scrap of paper, or if they're teaching young to hunt on the sacred mountain. Higher up, vultures, once sacred to the ancients, still circle overhead. But that's not what makes this place so sacred. To understand why the mountain was special, you have to look at it very closely. See that pinnacle over there? That's the reason this mountain is so holy. Can you see what it looks like? If you ask any ancient Egyptian, he would have told you the same thing. A cobra. And cobras were very special. The cobra was the protector of royalty in ancient Egypt. Everyone knows the gold mask of Tutankhamun. But have you ever looked closely at what's on the forehead? 
the pharaohs of Egypt were depicted with a cobra on their crowns, ready to kill the king's enemies. The rearing cobra at Gebel Barkal was an omen. There's nothing like it in all of Egypt or Nubia. This was a message from the gods. Even today, the local cemetery is in the shadow of the pure mountain of the black kings of Nubia. But you know, there's a secret to these Nubian pyramids, a secret that would take centuries to uncover. Everyone thought the pyramids of the Nubian kings were just like Egyptian pyramids. Egyptian pyramids contained passageways, corridors, hidden chambers, all designed to protect the treasures and mummies of the kings. But excavators soon found out the Nubian pyramids were unlike any other they had ever seen before. They contained no chambers, no passages, there were no treasures or mummies. So where were the kings and queens of Nubia buried? This was just what American archaeologist George Reisner wanted to find out when he started excavating in the Sudan in 1916. Harvard archaeologist George Reisner was a real character. He was a workaholic and excavated year-round. In the summer, he worked in Egypt. Nobody excavates in Egypt in the summer. You can boil your brains in the heat. In winter, he moved to the Sudan, where he worked on the pyramids of the Nubian kings. Reisner was passionate about everything. He was a chain smoker. He smoked anything from good Cuban cigars to terrible Egyptian cigarettes. But in the evenings, he relaxed with murder mysteries. And what he used to do is after he read a mystery, he would grade them like a, like a student's paper. This one got an A minus. This one over here, the clue of the hungry corpse, well, it wasn't so good. It only gets a B. But solving the mystery of the lost tombs of the kings of Nubia was just the kind of puzzle Reisner loved. Reisner started his quest in the shadow of Gebel Barkal, the holy mountain. He quickly discovered the pyramids were solid, no burials here. Reisner realized the burials wouldn't be far from the pyramids. And he was a good excavator. He found it. Rock cut steps right in front of the pyramid. The key was realizing that the burial wasn't inside or even under the pyramid. The rock cut steps led into a tomb like this one. Reisner had found the burials of the kings and queens of ancient Nubia all right. But let me tell you, he was in for a surprise. These are the traditional gods of ancient Egypt. So far, no surprises. And over here, it's a mummy, and it's on a traditional Egyptian funerary couch. But what you see is not what you get. This is your surprise. I know it doesn't look like much, but this is a Nubian funerary bed. You'd never see this in Egypt. You see, Egyptian kings and queens had a variety of fine stone for their sarcophagi. And inside these sarcophagi, they had beautifully carved wooden coffins, all to protect the mummy. But in Nubia, fine wood and stone were scarce, so the mummy was placed on a simple funerary bed. Once again, the kings and queens of Nubia were doing it their way. So why did the Nubian kings and queens build pyramids if they weren't going to be buried in them? The pyramids of Nubia were status symbols. They said wealth and eternity, the ultimate tombstone. The black Nubian kings were blending great Egyptian traditions with their own customs. Reisner found the burials of the Nubian kings all right, 
But in the end, the pharaohs themselves eluded him. Their mummies had been destroyed by tomb robbers. But let me show you as close as he ever got to a Nubian king, the skull of the pharaoh Shabitko. Now it's in the Peabody Museum at Harvard, and I just want to pay my respects. This is the skull Reisner found. He thought he had found a pharaoh, but there's a problem. Let me show you. The skull is delicate. It's what we call gracile. It's not robust like a man's skull. And if you look around the orbits here, the eyes, there's very fragile lines, very delicate. This is almost certainly the skull of a female. Reisner thought he had found a king. I don't think so. But coming from Nubia, this could well have been a queen. You see, the queens of Nubia were almost as powerful as the kings. On the walls of their chapels and temples, they're shown as powerful women, as big as the kings. You'd never see that in Egypt. Watch. I'm going to show you something you can't do in Egypt. Touch two pyramids at the same time. You see, things were different in Nubia. The queens of Nubia could have pyramids as big as their husbands. And they did. There are more pyramids in Nubia than in Egypt. They dot the desert for hundreds of miles. In Egypt, they were huge affairs designed to protect the treasures of a king. In Nubia, they were elegant memorials, clustered together like a family, happy to be close. Halfway around the world from Nubia, another ancient kingdom was building pyramids. But for a reason so ghastly, the Nubians never would have imagined. The one thing that people know about the Aztecs of Mexico is that they practiced human sacrifice. What they don't know is just how much one account mentions 20,000 captive warriors sacrificed in four days. Human sacrifice was an essential part of Aztec culture, and pyramids were right in the middle of it. This Aztec pyramid was a temple, a place of worship. I know that sounds fine, but it's not. You see, the Aztec gods required blood, human blood. That's why they built this pyramid. And you see the curve in this stone? The victim was stretched across it, his arms and legs held out by priests, and then his heart was ripped out of his chest while it was still beating. And our little pyramid steps are exceptionally steep so that after the heart was taken out, the body would roll all the way down to the bottom, shedding more blood for the gods. The whole fabric of Aztec society was tied to pyramid building and human sacrifice. You can see this right in the heart of Mexico City, in the middle of the market. For a warrior to gain status, he had to capture enemy warriors alive for sacrifice. The more sacrifices, the more status. And as the number of sacrifices increased, they built bigger and bigger pyramids and bigger and bigger racks to display the victims' skulls. Stone racks like this one weren't just fantasy. I want to show you something you've never seen before. This is the skull of a young man, maybe 25, 30, prime of life, possibly a warrior. But this isn't a battle wound. This is prepared, it's cut. After they sacrificed him, this was cut out so the skull could be placed on a rack just like that one. When the Aztecs wanted a bigger pyramid, they simply built over an old one, using it as the core and covered it with the new construction. At this excavation, you can see the steps of older pyramids that were enclosed inside newer ones. Just like Russian dolls, one inside the other. Every king wanted to outdo the previous one. 
so he had to make more sacrifices, and this required bigger and bigger pyramids. The Aztecs were trapped in a spiral of human sacrifice and pyramid building. But they weren't the only ancient Americans into human sacrifice. Centuries before the Aztecs, the Maya were sacrificing humans, but with their own special twist. Maya pyramids stretch for 1,200 miles throughout Central America, and clustered among them are ceremonial ball courts. They have everything that modern ball courts have, seats for spectators, even a skybox for the king. The world's first team sport was played on this court. I want to show you something neat about this ball court. Listen. Amazing acoustics, huh? But this court wasn't about fun and games. A thousand years ago, something far more serious took place on this court. Don't think of it as a friendly Sunday pickup game. It was a game born from the myth of the hero twins. Brothers so skilled at the ball game that the lords of death summoned them to the underworld for a competition. We don't have the rule book, but the game was a combination of modern soccer and basketball. The goal was to get a ball through a stone hoop high on a wall, but you couldn't use your hands, only your feet and hips. Sometimes the game went on for days. When the Spanish first saw the Maya play, they were amazed by the ball. They had never seen rubber, and the ball seemed possessed as it bounced. In the myth, the twins defeated the gods, so life triumphed over death. For the Maya, the ball courts were entrances to the underworld. Each time the Maya played, they were reenacting the deeds of the hero twins. At the game's conclusion, the losers were sacrificed to please the gods, their skulls displayed in skull racks. The idea of human sacrifice was central to the ancient Americas. Everybody was doing it, Maya, Aztec, and when they weren't sacrificing, they were building pyramids. The two go together. If you want to see where pyramids and sacrifice really go together, Come with me to the hottest spot for pyramid research, Peru. That's where it's all happening. In South America, on Peru's northern coast, archaeologists are making amazing discoveries. More has been discovered about ancient Peru in the last 20 years than in the previous 200. Royal burials, gold, incredible ceramics, human sacrifice, and it all came from pyramids. On the cutting edge of all these discoveries is Dr. Steve Bourget. At his site in the Viru Valley, Steve and his students are turning up something new every day. You want painted walls? He's got it. Bourget has just discovered nine llamas that were sacrificed and placed under the floor of one of the rooms inside the pyramid. But Bourget's pyramid is only one of many. 1,500 years ago, a mysterious people called the Moche were building pyramids that rivaled Egypt's biggest. The Moche didn't have much stone, so they used mud brick to build their pyramids. It took 150 million bricks to build this baby, Peru's Pyramid of the Sun. But we really don't know what it was used for. That's because the Moche didn't have a written language. But what they did leave behind are pots, thousands of them. They're basically two kinds, and they're both weird. One kind is shaped like people, and many are bound prisoners. The other kind of moche pot is pretty strange, too. It has painted scenes which archaeologists thought were mythological. Only recently has the real story been deciphered. And I bet you can guess what's involved.
UCLA's Christopher Donnan has spent decades studying the scenes on Moche Potts. His colleague, Donna McClelland, has patiently copied more than 20,000 scenes. And one theme keeps repeating itself. Human sacrifice. The scenes always end with a sinister character in a fancy headdress drinking a cup of blood. Were the gruesome scenes on the pots real events? Or were they moche myths? Stories of terrible things that the gods supposedly did to each other. For years, archaeologists weren't sure. Then a pyramid revealed the answer. Skeletons of young men. But these weren't ordinary skeletons. The victims had been horribly tortured and mutilated. Hands were amputated. Legs dislocated from their sockets while the victims were still alive. And finally, the victims were killed by a blow to the head. Some of the victims suffered one final indignity. These are their bones. When a friend of mine, John Verano, looked at them, he found something shocking. I want to show it to you. It's not easy to see, but it's interesting. Look very closely over here at these vertebrae. Can you see those very fine cut marks? That's the kind of cut you get when you're taking away the flesh very carefully so that you're left with a complete skeleton. Now, why did the moche want a complete skeleton? It wasn't for an anatomy lesson. The moche had a bizarre ceremony where they made the skeletons dance. The moche were playing with the skeletons of their victims. But that's not all we know about these poor captives. You'll be amazed. At Peru's Pyramid of the Moon, archaeologist Santiago Uceda has made incredible discoveries, finds no one ever believed possible. He's been able to reconstruct the last moments of the victims' lives on the day of their sacrifice. It all started on the plaza, in front of the pyramid. The crowds would have gathered to watch the spectacle. The captives were led through this passageway, like cattle. Then they were paraded past paintings of the warriors who had conquered them. Imagine what they were thinking. As they wound their way through the pyramid, past frescoes of angry gods, they were well aware of the horrors that awaited them. The captives, knowing they would be sacrificed, were brought here to the heart of the pyramid. Then, they were taken into this room. Imagine it with gleaming white walls. But then, they were tortured till they bled profusely, all so the gods would be pleased. Slowly, painfully, the ceremony was nearing its conclusion. After they drained the blood from the living victims, they put it in a cup and brought it here, to this room. Then a high priest, with the cup in his hand, mounted these stairs and presented the cup to the Lord of the Pyramid. Finally, the bleeding, half-dead captives were taken to the sacred rock and killed. It's amazing that archaeologists found the real victims of the sacrifices. But remember that sinister character on Donnan's pots? The one with the fantastic headdress who receives the cup of blood? Could he be real too? The answer came in a phone call to leading Peruvian archaeologist Walter Alva. It was very late, about 11 o'clock. The chief of police called me and said, Doctor, you have to come down urgently. We have something important that you must see right now. I had a bad cold, bronchitis with a fever. So I said, I can come tomorrow. Well, he was a close friend. And he said, when you are here, all your aches will go away. Looters digging in the pyramid at Sipan had struck gold. Ear spools, necklaces, you name it, they found it.
But the greatest treasure of all was still in the ground, waiting for Walter Alva. Alva began a careful, meticulous excavation, and soon he found South America's equivalent of Tutankhamun's tomb, the intact burial of the Lord of Sipan, complete with all its treasures. This is the Lord of Sipan, at least what's left of him. He looks like this because the room in which he was buried collapsed and tons of mud bricks fell on him. But the bones still have a lot to tell us. He was middle-aged, but look over here at his vertebrae, the ones that have survived. They're in very good condition. He didn't carry any heavy loads. And the arms, they're damaged, but we can still tell they're delicate, what we call gracile. He didn't do much work. He was the Lord of Sipan. He was carried everywhere on a sedan chair. I can even show you the chair. Then you'll see why I say he was involved in human sacrifice. This drawing appears on a moche pot. It's a traditional sacrifice scene. Look at the bottom row. You can see the naked captives. One's about to have his throat cut. His weapons and uniform are tied in a bundle to the right. But on the left is a carrying chair, and it's empty. Someone important has been brought to the sacrifice. I think it's our Lord of Sipan. Now, look at the top row. The sinister character is receiving a cup of the victim's blood. His clothes, headdress, ornaments are just like what Alva found in the Lord of Sipan's tomb. He's the character on Donan's pots. These weren't mythical characters. They were real people involved in human sacrifice. The moche pots are snapshots of ancient rituals. I bet you've had enough of human sacrifice. Stick around and I'll take you to a pyramid that takes you to another world. Asian pyramids are different from Egyptian or South American pyramids. The great temple of Angkor Wat in Cambodia is so huge that at first it's hard to see that it has pyramids. It's only from the air that you can clearly see its five pyramids. No one was buried here, and no sacrifices took place. It's really a map, a sacred map, and the five pyramid towers reflect the five peaks of the mythical Mount Meru, the home of the gods. In southern India, the pyramids of Majurai Temple also echo the peaks of Mount Meru. But here, they're covered with thousands and thousands of Hindu gods. Asian pyramids have an otherworldly feeling. But let me show you the strangest of all Asian pyramids. It's in the rice fields of Java, one of Indonesia's largest islands. It's tucked away, out of the mainstream of Indonesian life. That's because it's a pyramid designed to help you escape from the world. But don't view it just as a pyramid. It's a teaching machine, intended to take you somewhere you've never been. Pilgrims have been coming to see the carvings at Borbador for a thousand years. They would start here, on the lowest level. It's kind of like the Buddhist Ten Commandments, the do's and don'ts of life. He's getting drunk. And over there, that's the dancing girls. They're showing you the dangers of being a party animal. You see, everything's unstable. They're about to fall down. So what do you do? It's a no-brainer. Avoid these ladies. Be like this guy over here. He's a family man. There's his wife, his child. Everything's calm. Everything's peaceful. There's even a panel that tells you about what happens to you if you kill a rat. You see, for the Buddhists, even the life of a rat is sacred, so you can't kill rats. The pilgrim starts working his way up this terrace, a path that will literally take him to another world, free of all suffering and pain. In 
ancient times, monks would have explained each scene to our pilgrim. And there are three miles of scenes. Our pilgrim may even have had to pass a test before proceeding to the next level. And there are 10 levels. You can climb to the top of Borbador in about five minutes, but that's not what it's about. It's not the Borbador 10K. You see, Borbador is about enlightenment, being free of this physical world, and that takes time. Every step our pilgrim takes brings him closer to enlightenment and further from the everyday world below. As the pilgrim goes higher and higher, the scenes become more difficult to figure out. By the time our pilgrim reaches this level, his brains are probably scrambled. It may have taken him years to get this far. And now the going gets tougher. There's no more easy stories to help him. This is PhD Buddhism. He has spent years in Borbador's dark corridors, staring at carved scenes, trying to understand their meaning, searching for enlightenment. Finally, you reach the last panel, number 1,460. And then, this building does something absolutely amazing. But I'm not going to tell you what it is. I'm just going to let you see for yourself. It shoots you to another world. No more narrow, dark, cramped corridors. No more panels to study. Just open sky, volcanoes, and the Buddha. Our pilgrims graduated. This is what they call the thunderbolt. You're hurled into enlightenment, ready to transfer to the next world. Unlike other pyramids, Borobudur wasn't a temple, and it wasn't a tomb. It was the real Stargate, a pyramid that took you to another world. But back in the real world, the Black Nubian kings were having real problems. So real, they wished they could find another world. You'll see. Remember our pious Nubian kings who conquered Egypt and rekindled the flame of pyramid building? Well, they had their problems too. Defeated by the Egyptians, they were forced to retreat south, deep into the Nubian desert. Their reign over Egypt had ended. This is the kind of desert where a plain that went down 50 years ago remains virtually untouched. My driver is Michele Bajo, an Italian who is one of the best professional desert drivers in Africa. Here, the desert is so flat that you see nothing but horizon and mirages. With no visual clues to guide him, even Michele is forced to use a global positioning satellite to get us across. Without the GPS, I don't think we could make it. It's the kind of desert that isolated the Nubians, allowing them to build a new capital at Meroe. There, away from the rest of the world, they built another kingdom complete with fields of elegant pyramids. For me, these are the most romantic pyramids on earth. But the kings of Nubia didn't just have style. They had power. People don't realize how powerful these Nubians were. If you want to see, come with me to Boston's Museum of Fine Arts. This museum has a fabulous collection. But before I show you how powerful the Nubians were, I want to show you something that has nothing to do with pyramids, nothing to do with what we're talking about, but I think it's the most incredible object ever to come out of ancient Egypt. This is it. Forget Tutankhamun's treasures. 
this is better. Can you see what it is? It's a loincloth, a simple wraparound garment. But what's amazing about it is it's not woven. It's cut out of a single piece of leather. Look at those little diamond cutouts. Nobody knows how that was done. But I didn't bring you here to see some old underwear. Come on with me, and now I'll show you just how powerful the Nubians were. Meet King Espelta, a Nubian. Look at that face. I take orders from that guy. But wait till you see what's in the museum's basement. Amazingly, a spelter was buried in a huge sarcophagus, which is so heavy that no floor in the museum can support it. That's why it's in the basement. This is the largest sarcophagus ever made for a king. That's how powerful he was. But even the kingdom of Nubia couldn't last forever. Eventually, the pyramid fields were abandoned and became targets for tomb robbers. That's why the pyramids don't have their tops. In 1830, an Italian adventurer named Fellini found treasure. Not in the pyramid, but in the queen's burial chamber. There were more than a hundred gold rings, necklaces, bracelets that far surpassed the treasures found in any Egyptian queen's burial. Fellini thought that the other burial chambers might contain similar treasure. So to throw others off the track, he lied and claimed he had found the treasure in a secret chamber in the top of the pyramid. Soon, other treasure hunters were decapitating every pyramid in sight. In its heyday, the kingdom of Nubia was one to be reckoned with, and its kings and queens continued to build their pyramids well into the Christian era. But even the great rulers of Nubia couldn't build forever. This is where it all ends, with this little pyramid. You see, about 300 AD, a Nubian king built the last pyramid in Africa, and with it ended 3,000 years of pyramid building. On this spot, the flame went out forever. I wonder if when the last king wrote his name on this pyramid, he knew this was the end. A tradition born in the sands of Egypt had died in the Nubian desert. No more would pyramids pierce the African sky. No more would kings and queens of Nubia build pyramids. Here, in the remote Nubian desert, the sun finally set on the last African pyramid. It's a harsh country. The locals say, when God made the Sudan, he laughed. Out here, there are more scorpions than people. Lots more. When you finally leave the desert, you ferry across the Nile. No bridges here. The locals don't see many foreigners, and they're friendly and curious. Yes. 
Samak Tamar, huh? No, Hanuk Abir. Yes. Hanuk Abir. Agad, Agad. Yes, yes. See, Samak Bi Karaba, too. It's out of Samak Bi Karaba? Yeah, you call him Dra'ash? Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. On the way to Taharka's Pyramid, you can drive for days never seeing another vehicle. But then, in the middle of nowhere, a place that time forgot. A desert well a well so deep that you can see the bottom only at noon, when the sun is directly overhead. I ask one of the herdsmen how many meters deep the well is, and he says 48, about 150 feet. But this can't be right. The rope the camel pulls out of the well is twice that. Finally, we work it out. They don't measure in meters or feet. He means men. The well is 48 men deep. These people are the Bisharim. Egyptian pyramids are all about immortality, guarding the king's mummy so he could resurrect in the next world. Everybody knows the pyramids of Giza, but I want to show you King Unas's improved deluxe model, and it comes with a new feature, magic. I'm taking you into the spiritual heart of King Unas's pyramid. This is the oldest significant body of texts in the world, and it's pure magic, all intended to protect the pharaoh's mummy. There are spells for everything. There's a spell that says King Unus's mummy won't be bitten by a scorpion. There's a spell that says the journey to the next world will go smoothly. Up there, there's even a spell that says King Unus devours the entrails of his enemies. Pretty powerful, huh? But what you have to remember is that this was even more important than life and death. This was for eternity. So 4,500 years ago, Unus and all his treasures were buried in his pyramid. But it didn't work. Even Unus's magical spells couldn't stop tomb robbers searching for gold. And the pyramids of Giza? They were robbed too. You see, Pyramids were obvious targets. They said, rob me. So Pharaoh stopped building pyramids. It was the end of an era. Tutankhamun's golden treasures, they weren't found in a pyramid. He, along with later Pharaohs, chose to be buried in secret tombs, hidden in the remote Valley of the Kings. That's where Ramses the Great the Pharaoh of the Exodus was laid to rest. The only face from the Bible we may ever see. When the warrior king, Tutmosis III, was buried in the valley, it had been centuries since a Pharaoh of Egypt had been laid to rest beneath the pyramid. Their time had passed. Egypt would never build another pyramid. And then, in remote Africa, the flame was lit again. A tribe that for hundreds of years has lived in this desert. Life has hardly changed for them over the centuries. This is a place that time really has forgotten. From the well, it's still a long ride to Taharka's Pyramid. And then it appears, surrounded by those of his descendants. 
Today, the Great King's Pyramid is in ruins, but this is the spot where it all started again. This is where the first pyramid in nearly a thousand years was built, and pyramid building would continue for centuries here in Nubia. But the Nubians would do it their way. You can see the Nubian pyramids are much steeper than the Egyptian ones. But that's not the only difference. I want to show you how they were built. Let me introduce you to the Shadouf, the crane of ancient Egypt and Nubia. It's basically a weight on the end of a stick. They're still in use in Egypt today to raise water from the Nile. The Nubian kings used Shadoufs to raise the blocks of their pyramids. Dr. Fritz Hinkel is the dean of Nubian pyramids. For 40 years, he's been studying and reconstructing the pyramids of the kings of Nubia. Using the Shadouf, just like in ancient times, Hinkel rebuilds pyramids. Hinkel has figured out that when you use a shadouf to raise your blocks, you get steep angles. You can't place a block very far from where your shadouf is. The construction device explains why these pyramids are so steep. The Nubian kings revived pyramid building, but they did it their way. Now, let me give you a Bible quiz. Who is the only pyramid builder named in the Bible? Here's your clue. He's a Nubian. Taharqa. Taharqa the pharaoh who revived pyramid building is mentioned in the Bible as a warrior. But he's not the only one in his family with a biblical connection. Let me show you something neat about Taharqa's nephew, Shabaka. It's in the British Museum. Almost everybody walks by it on the way to the more famous Egyptian treasures. But the Shabaka stone is one of the most amazing things in the museum. Can you figure out why there's a square hole in the middle? It was made into a grindstone when a farmer found it 200 years ago. But it wasn't always a grindstone. Look over here. You can see the hieroglyphs. They're worn from the grinding, but they still tell a story. A story from the Bible. Over here, this is just the introduction. It says that Shabaka, our Nubian king, found an ancient text and had it carved on this slab. But the real story starts here, with the god Ptah. It says that in the beginning, Ptah said words and the world came into existence. Now, if you remember your Bible, that'll sound familiar. In the first verse of John, it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. So centuries before the Christian Bible, a pious Nubian king was writing the same belief on this stone. The Nubian rulers were thinkers, interested in Egyptian religion and traditions. But when the time came to be buried, they returned to their beloved homeland, Nubia, and to a sacred mountain unlike any other. In the ancient language, it was called Juwab, the pure mountain. And even today, the modern Arabic, Gebel Barkal, means the same. History has forgotten Gebel Barkal. But for both the ancient Nubians and Egyptians, this was their Mecca and Jerusalem. It was one of the ancient world's most sacred places. The temples are ruined now, but 2,000 years ago, this was as grand as any of Egypt's great temples. Gebel Barkal was home of the god Amun, the hidden one. This is where the Nubian pharaohs would build their pyramids. Hundreds of miles south, up the Nile, past the raging cataracts, past terrifying colossal statues of Ramses the Great, 
to the land the Egyptians called Ta Seti, the land of the bow. A land of legendary archers, of gold, the land of Nubia. It was a special time when amazing things could happen. For centuries, Egypt dominated Nubia, but this was about to change. This was a time when a black king of Nubia would lead his army north, past the cataracts, past the scornful faces of Pharaoh Ramses. This must have given our Nubian king a special pleasure. Ramses had always depicted Nubians as bound captives. Now it would be their turn. It was a time when black kings with exotic names, Shabaka, Shabitko, and Taharka, conquered mighty Egypt and ruled the Nile. These were no ordinary foreign conquerors. They knew of Egypt's greatness, its fabulous temples and tombs, its hundreds of gods, and they vowed to restore declining Egypt to her past glory. The Nubian kings rebuilt decaying temples and made offerings to Egyptian gods. The hero of our story is the great pharaoh Taharqa. Taharqa's campaign north into Egypt was the first time he had seen the pyramids. And when he returned home to Nubia, he vowed to build one of his own. After a thousand years, the flame of pyramid building was rekindled. I want to show you where it all happened, but we have to go deep into Africa, to Africa's largest country, the Sudan. A million square miles, much of it unexplored desert. Egyptian pyramids are all about immortality, guarding the king's mummy so he could resurrect in the next world. Everybody knows the pyramids of Giza, but I want to show you King Unis's improved deluxe model, and it comes with a new feature, magic. I'm taking you into the spiritual heart of King Unis's pyramid. This is the oldest significant body of texts in the world, and it's pure magic, all intended to protect the pharaoh's mummy. There are spells for everything. There's a spell that says King Unus's mummy won't be bitten by a scorpion. There's a spell that says the journey to the next world will go smoothly. Up there, there's even a spell that says King Unus devours the entrails of his enemies. Pretty powerful, huh? But what you have to remember is that this was even more important than life and death. This was for eternity. So 4,500 years ago, Unus and all his treasures were buried in his pyramid. But it didn't work. Even Unus's magical spells couldn't stop tomb robbers searching for gold. And the pyramids of Giza? They were robbed too. You see, Pyramids were obvious targets. They said, rob me. So Pharaoh stopped building pyramids. It was the end of an era. It was a time when a black king of Nubia would lead his army north, past the cataracts, past the scornful faces of Pharaoh Ramses. This must have given our Nubian king a special pleasure. Ramses had always depicted Nubians as bound captives. Now it would be their turn. It was a time when black kings with exotic names, Shabaka, Shabitko, and Taharka, conquered mighty Egypt and ruled the Nile. foreign conquerors. They knew of Egypt's greatness, its fabulous temples and tombs, its hundreds of gods, 
and they vowed to restore declining Egypt to her past glory. The Nubian kings rebuilt decaying temples and made offerings to Egyptian gods. The hero of our story is the great pharaoh Taharqa. Taharqa's campaign north into Egypt was the first time he had seen the pyramids. And when he returned home to Nubia, he vowed to build one of his own. After a thousand years, the flame of pyramid building was rekindled. I want to show you where it all happened, but we have to go deep into Africa, to Africa's largest country, the Sudan. A million square miles, much of it unexplored desert. It's a harsh country. The locals say, when God made the Sudan, he laughed. Out here, there are more scorpions than people. Lots more. When you finally leave the desert, you ferry across the Nile. No bridges here. The locals don't see many foreigners, and they're friendly and curious. Yes, yes. Yes, yes. On the way to Taharqa's pyramid, you can drive for days never seeing another vehicle. But then, in the middle of nowhere, a place that time forgot. A desert well, a well so deep that you can see the bottom only at noon when the sun is directly overhead. I ask one of the herdsmen how many meters deep the well is, and he says 48, about 150 feet. But this can't be right. The rope the camel pulls out of the well is twice that. Finally, we work it out. They don't measure in meters or feet. He means men. The well is 48 men deep. These people are the Bisharim, a tribe that for hundreds of years has lived in this desert. Life has hardly changed for them over the centuries. This is a place that time really has forgotten. From the well, it's still a long ride to Taharqa's pyramid. And then it appears surrounded by those of his descendants. Today, the great king's pyramid is in ruins, but this is the spot where it all started again. Tutankhamun's golden treasures, they weren't found in a pyramid. He, along with later pharaohs, chose to be buried in secret tombs, hidden in the remote valley of the kings. That's where Ramses the Great the pharaoh of the Exodus was laid to rest, the only face from the Bible we may ever see. When the warrior king, Tutmosis III, was buried in the valley, it had been centuries since a pharaoh of Egypt had been laid to rest beneath the pyramid. Their time had passed. Egypt would never build another pyramid.
And then, in remote Africa, the flame was lit again. Hundreds of miles south, up the Nile, past the raging cataracts, past terrifying colossal statues of Ramses the Great, to the land the Egyptians called Ta Seti, the land of the bow. A land of legendary archers, of gold, the land of Nubia. It was a special time when amazing things could happen. For centuries, Egypt dominated Nubia, but this was about to change. <laughs> 